So <laughs> Wim always has me uh, give this lecture because he's going to lecture on my equations. So I figured you should get this from the horse's mouth, <laughs> which is me. <laughs> and I always uh, plan to um, do this with the laptop, but I always end up giving a chalk talk. So <laughs> I think it actually is better for uh, doing uh, things with equations on the board. So there's, um, there's a number of things I want to uh, introduce you to that you may not be familiar with concerning how you do the mathematics of um, neural networks. So, um, but I always like to stress uh, um, the history of something and the historical background to this stuff. So um, I was a graduate student at MIT from 1958 to 62. I worked with the, uh, the founders of uh, neural network uh, studies, uh, McCulloch and Pitts, and also with Norbert Wiener and uh, Claude Shannon. So I have a, and in England, I had worked with Dennis Gabor, the inventor of ho holography but who was also interested in uh, machine learning and, uh, and how the brain works and things like that. So sometime in 1962, I asked uh, um, three of my uh, mentors, McCulloch and Pitts and Norbert Wiener, what kind of mathematics do they, did they think was uh, needed to uh, um, begin to um, uh, try to understand biological neural networks, not artificial neural networks, uh, AI and machine learning and stuff like that, which a lot of people at MIT were very much concerned with and pioneers in the field, but um, the neural networks of the brain. It was quite interesting. McCulloch said, well, you should use the kind of mathematics that Walter Pitts and I used uh, in our 1943 paper, which was written on this campus on uh, called uh, A Logical Calculus of the Ideas Imminent in and." in nervous activity. And it was the first use of, uh, of um, um, what are called linear threshold elements, very simplified um, um, uh, models of a neuron that could actually ca calculate uh, logical functions like and, or, and not. And we know from mathematical logic that if you can calculate and, or, and not with three different devices or with one device with different configurations of its inputs and output, then, um, and you, get, you provide um, uh, a network that has loops in it, uh, then uh, uh, if such a system is provided with as much memory as it ever needs, it's equivalent to a universal Turing machine. And um, I don't know how many of you have you seen the, the movie with uh, uh, Turing recently, The Imitation Game, but the reason he got the job of decoding the uh, German ciphers in World War II was because he had, in fact, invented what is now called the Turing machine. He was the expert on computation, long before anybody else had even begun to appreciate it, with the possible exception of the mathematician at Princeton, John von Neumann, with whom he actually interacted a little bit in 1936 and 37. In 36, he, uh, he wrote this paper called on the, on the Entscheidungsproblem, which means the on the decision problem, how you can decide whether a mathematical logic formula is either true or false. And Turing um, uh, built on the work of Gödel, who, the, who produced a, a famous theorem. I, uh, around about the turn of the 20th century, the, the German mathematician Hilbert uh, um, claimed that it, uh, it might be possible to reduce mathematics to logic. And then if you could um, reduce all mathematics to logic, to logical expressions, um, and, he, and you were able to use a, the methodology of mathematical logic for finding the truth or falsity of a, any proposition, uh, then you could solve all of mathematics. And Whitehead and Russell um, wrote a, a famous um, big book, Principia Mathematica, where they attempted to do this, but they ran into some difficulties. They found that they, they got uh, into uh, logical paradoxes. Something was both true and false at the same time, not consistency. And um, 
this situation uh, didn't seem to be resolvable. It wasn't until the mid-1920s, uh, late 20s, that the um, Romanian logician um, Gödel proved a very, very startling conclusion. He said, if, uh, he said you, um, you can have three things in a logical system. One, it should be adequate to represent whatever you want to represent. Secondly, it should be consistent. You shouldn't be able to prove something to be both true and false at the same time. And thirdly, it should be complete. You should be able to express within the formalism of the logic, the logical system, all the propositions that you want to express. And then Gödel uh, basically showed that uh, any logical system, you could only have two out of th those three, never all three. You can't have something that's adequate consistent and complete. You can have adequate and consistent, but then it will be incomplete. There will be formulas uh, that you can state that cannot be proved to be either true or false with the logical system in, uh, that you start with. So, uh, so that produced a, uh, uh, a big surprise for the whole community of logicians and people in mathematics who were interested in logic. And what Turing did was to formalize Gödel's theorem in a machine. And the little machine had a, con a little control system, and it had a, a, an infinite tape, and you could make marks on the tape, either a dot or not. So it had a binary code. And the tape uh, contained some message and instructions on how to calculate something. And what Turing showed was that um, because of Gödel's theorem, you could um, have a little program in, in the little control uh, system that worked on the tape, put, erased a mark or put a mark where there was a blank, and moved the tape to the next field and kept doing this. And he showed that for most problems, uh, all the problems that could be solved to give a, a, a yes or no answer, proposition was true or false, uh, the machine would keep going until it stopped. And then what was written on the tape was the answer. But then he showed that there were some problems, no matter how um, long you waited, the machine never stopped. This is called the halting problem for the Turing machine. And these correspond to the undecidable propositions that Gödel had shown could exist uh, in all logical systems. And then he showed that such a machine, if you, prog if you wrote a little program that, uh, for how it worked, uh, could simulate any, any other machine you could possibly dream up. So that was the universal Turing machine. And so Turing had done this, um, uh, uh, he was still in his mid-twenties, and uh, um, he, was, uh, um, he was given the job of deciphering the uh, German cipher codes during the war, which were generated by a machine with many different rotors and produced such a huge number of possible combinations that it seemed impossible to uh, crack the code. But in fact, he worked out building the first digital computer to actually do that. Then McCulloch and Pitts came along and showed that uh, you could get the equivalent of a Turing machine using uh, very, very simplified models of nerve cells, of neurons. And that was in 1943 on this campus. It was written when Pitts was 20 years old. And uh, it, it uh, triggered, basically, the, uh, the modern developments in the theory of neural networks, both artificial neural networks. Uh, but uh, by 1960, 61, 62, when I was uh, working with McCulloch and Pitts, it was clear, at least to me, that um, uh, for biological neural networks, you couldn't use the McCulloch-Pitts formalism because it was a computer program, basically, with a clock. But there aren't clocks in the brain, and they don't operate like simple logical switches most of the time. So the problem, so, so McCulloch's answer didn't um, uh, resonate with me. But Pitt said something that really interested me. He said, well, what you really want to do is to formulate the problem so you can use calculus, which, is a, which uh, uh, surprised me at the time that he should say that. And then I went and asked Norbert Wiener the same question. And Norbert, Norbert told me something that I didn't understand at the time. He said, you want to f uh, formulate the whole problem as a random process. 
and used the technology that I developed, meaning Norbert Wiener, in the 1930s uh, to solve um, um, uh, problems to do with stochastic processes. What he meant by that was that I should formulate the problem so I could use the methodology that Wiener had uh, uh, invented called the path integral method for looking at all the questions associated with the statistics associated with large-scale brain activity. And uh, at the time, I didn't understand what he was doing. And I had sat through quite a number of uh, uh, lectures of his, and in fact, repetitions of lectures of his. And I didn't really understand what he was talking about. Um, eventually, I worked out two things. One was the differential equation approach to neural networks, which I'm going to tell you about. And secondly, the stochastic uh, the, uh, approach to how to do the stochastic theory of neural networks. But that took me 40 years to do. Um, and so in this talk, I'm just going to introduce you to the, uh, the basic stuff. Uh, um, I had a postdoc uh, with me when I first came, uh, after I, I came here in 1967 to take over the, uh, the Committee on Mathematical Biology then, which was uh, developed by a, my predecessor, a man called Nicholas Ryshevsky. Uh, and um, I got a postdoc uh, named Hugh Wilson. And uh, I had formulated the, the equations. And uh, working with Hugh, we uh, polished them a bit and, uh, and looked at the uh, properties of the equations and wrote two papers in 1972 and 73. And I still have the original copies of the papers here. They're a bit. Uh, dog-eared now, but uh, and uh, I, uh, I'll try to give you a uh, the, the flavor of what's in these papers today. And uh, turns out they uh, um, they've survived the test of time, and they work like a charm on all the modern data that's now available. Uh, so nowadays they've become very popular. And so what Wim wanted me to do was to talk about these equations and uh, give you a feel for what's going on. So. Um, let, let's make a start on this. Um, I don't really need to look at these uh, papers, of course, I, but uh, just uh, in case I need to, I can do that. So um, the basic uh, idea is we've got some uh, set of neurons. And uh, we want to develop a, a formalism that allows us to use the methods of calculus. So the mcculloch pitts formalism is based on the idea that you have, uh, I'll draw one of their little pictures. Here's a picture of a nerve cell. And let's say it's a simple a linear threshold device. So this device is such that it, um, it doesn't fire if there isn't enough current into the uh, cell. And um, so here, if the current is less than a certain value, uh, uh, let's call the, the critical value at which it's, it's going to fire theta, that's the threshold of the neuron, uh, then it, uh, the activity jumps from 0 to 1. So you would describe this mathematically as a step function, a heavy side step function, that 0 for any uh, x um, less than 0, and then it goes, so if this is the y-axis, y is 0, for x less than theta and equals 1 for x greater than or equal to theta. So that's, a, that's called a heavy side step function. The problem with the heavy side step function is that it's not a continuous function. So it doesn't have a derivative at the threshold value. So you cannot use uh, the nice uh, mathematics of calculus to work with McCulloch-Pitts neurons. So what to do? In retrospect, it's pretty, pretty obvious. But in, in those days, it, was, it wasn't obvious what to do at all. And there were very few people working in the field. So you got to know everybody who was working in the field, no matter where they were in the world. Uh, but that changed. That's changed. And also, there weren't that many people working. Uh, so you had time to sit and think. And I actually got a grant from the US Navy, the Office of Naval Research, that allowed me to sit and think for quite a few years. And that led to uh, how to do this. 
So one problem I, I worked on and had a postdoc uh, working with me called Peter Johannesma from Holland was suppose instead of um, a deterministic model, we actually look at a stochastic model. So I imagine that I've got a, uh, a train of uh, impulses with, say, let's say, with a Poisson distribution of the intervals between spikes, just a random spiking process. And it feeds into one, a neuron. And then because of the threshold of the neuron, every so often there might be uh, an output pulse from the thing. So, and let's say that the, this neuron is a bit more realistic than this one. This one uh, just add this thing adds up all the impulses that are coming into it. And uh, if the total um, current from that is uh, greater than uh, theta, then it, it produces an output pulse. That's the, the McCulloch-Pitts neuron. But this thing is different. Every time you get an import, um, you get a little um, jump in the membrane potential, and then it decays exponentially. Because the membrane actually has, as you probably know, it has a, a, a capacitance and a resistance across the lipid bilayer constituting the membrane. Uh, so this is uh, the capacitance, this is this, and the time constant of this exponential decay, tau, is equal to the product of the resistance and the capacitance. So this is much more like an excitatory postsynaptic potential in a nerve cell. So it's a more realistic model to assume that this thing is sitting across the nerve membrane, this little uh, RC circuit. So now if you've got a bunch of spikes coming into this thing, what you'll get is some sort of uh, temporal uh, summation of the membrane voltage. And if it reaches the threshold, and in a normal neuron, this distance is about 15 millivolts, then, the, then you'll get a big action potential uh, out of this thing when it uh, actually reaches uh, the threshold. And so now you can write a differential equation um, uh, for the process, um, or, or you can actually formulate the whole thing as a stochastic process. In physics, this process is called the ornstein uhlenbeck process. And so you have to solve um, what's called the first passage problem. What, uh, how long, starting from rest, uh, on the average, does it take to reach the threshold and fire if you've got a plus on input to the thing? And when you solve that and you plot the probability of firing of the thing, instead of getting the step function, you get basically the integral of a probability density function that looks like that. Uh, why does it um, um, flatten out? Well, it's because um, you put into this something called the refractory period of a neuron. The re um, uh, when you get an action potential, it actually um, has a width of about one millisecond. So that tells you that the maximum firing rate is when you're firing all the time, but it, it can't be higher than a kilohertz, the rate, one over a, a millisecond. Uh, so that puts an upper bound on the firing rate, and you end up with this kind of curve. But that's a continuous curve. So that suggested to me that I, instead of using neurons that had um, this kind of uh, step function thing, a realistic model of a neuron, would basically have this kind of uh, function, th where this is the threshold, and some noise will give you firing below the threshold because the fluctuations will drive the system above uh, the threshold, but it'll flatten out at some firing rate. So here is a better uh, uh, model for the firing of a realistic neuron that has uh, resistance and capacitance in it. Okay. Now this thing. Um, I chose a particular function to do this, but there's, a, there's actually a better function. If I can make uh, uh, this happen, if I introduce a function 1 half, 1 plus uh, the hyperbolic tangent, tanch, of uh, the voltage divided by 2. That thing is what we call a, um, a smooth approximation, an analytic approximation to a step function. So now, with that particular model in mind, I can write differential equations for the firing of a neural network.
So to cut a long story short, uh, I formulated a, an, an equation that um, it roughly looks like this. Uh, for the firing rate, let's call it x of a neural network. The rate of change is equal to minus, uh, so there's a time constant involved in it, tau, uh, roughly like the RC constant, uh, equals minus um, x, there's some sort of decay, plus uh, the, a function f, and this will be the function f of the input current x, uh, of the input current, but maybe with some synaptic weights, because we know there are synapses involved in this process. So uh, there's a lot of synapses, little switches with resistances on, on them, and you can have a whole bunch of these on, an, on a neuron. And that would be a good circuit model for the behavior of neurons. And if you do that, you get some function of the current. And the current is proportional to the weights times the inputs from the network, plus some external uh, that, that would be recurrent connections. And you might have some uh, external input to the thing. There's a, a nonlinear differential equation that describes the firing rate of neurons. And nowadays, this is called either the canonical model or the firing rate model. Uh, that, that's basically the firing rate model. And that I actually introduced um, into the literature in about 1968. It took me about five years thinking to get from this step to this step. Now, you might think, well, this is trivial. All you've done is smoothed out the, the, um, the step function, and now you've got the sigmoid. I was so uh, focused on um, doing the uh, calculus for neural networks that I, I didn't apply this to the, uh, another problem that people were working on at the time. And this is the problem of machine learning. How do you train a uh, neural network to compute arbitrary Boolean functions? Suppose you don't program it, but you train it to do that. Is there a way to train it? The, the answer is yes, but you have to use this uh, function to do it, because you have to use calculus, because you're going to use Newton's law for finding a, a local minimum, which involves calculating a derivative and setting the rate of change of the, uh, uh, as proportional to the negative of the derivative. And that's the secret of machine learning. And uh, I didn't uh, actually uh, do that. And it took another 25 years before some people saw that they could do it using this sigmoid model of mine for machine learning. Um, so I set back the field by about 25 years by not working on it. Because it turns out it's a trivial problem to do it. But uh, it's only trivial after you see how to do it, though. That's the problem. So what I did was a little different. I said, now we've got this firing rate model. How can we embed it in a, a, statist a statistical theory for large-scale brain activity? And so I, instead of thinking about a single neuron, I introduced into the literature, the, and it wasn't really me. Uh, other people had already did, done this, but they hadn't formulated the equations correctly. I introduced into the field population thinking. Because if you think about the neocortex, which is what we're object of interest to study, it's got something like 5 times uh, 10 to the 10th neurons, 50 billion neurons. And even a little block of tissue, this, um, the, uh, the, the, the neocortex is about three millimeters thick. But if you were to take it and, and do what the neuroanatomists do and, and flatten it out, take it out of the brain, flatten it out, it would be approximately uh, a meter by a meter square by three millimeters thick. So it's effectively a two-dimensional sheet. And in there is 10, uh, uh, 50 billion neurons. So every little block of tissue in there has somewhere between um, 250,000 to 750,000 neurons. And every one of them is connected uh, approximately to uh, several thousand other neurons. You get several thousand uh, inputs. It's the number of synapses ending on a cortical neuron is of that order. 
there's no possible way you can know the, the, the uh, strength of all the synaptic connections. There's no possible way you can know what the firing state is of every neuron in this little block of tissue. You certainly can't know it for any appreciable number of neurons. Because even if you're going to build a replica of the brain, which is, in my opinion, a ludicrous idea, um, you still couldn't know th that. That means you, um, you have to take a statistical approach to what's going on. So I set up a statistical model for this. And out of it, I was able to uh, um, get the beginnings of um, a population theory for what goes on in large populations of neurons. And then I was joined by my uh, postdoc, uh, Hugh Wilson. And the wilson cowan equations, as they are now known, was uh, uh, resulted from this. And so let me just write out the, the form. Well, I, again, I don't need to look at that. But they look like this. Um, D by dt, uh, let's say excitatory activity, which is a function of position and time, is equal to minus some constant alpha e to xt. Uh, that's the equivalent of what's written for the firing rate model. Plus one, a term 1 minus e xt which is the fraction of neurons that have not fired in the previous instant. So multiplied by a, a function like this thing, which we'll call, we'll call this function, um, or we'll just call it f, it doesn't matter, um, f of the current. But what does the current look like? Well, uh, basically, uh, the current looks like the following. It's the integral over space uh, of all the neurons at um, the position x prime that are connected to x with the weight w, multiplied by the activity at x prime at time t. Okay. dx prime. So there. I haven't said anything about an external input yet, so let's put an external input as well in. Plus h x t. Okay, and there is a, uh, the w a form of the wilson cowan equations uh, for a single um, excitatory population of neurons receiving an input H. So here's a, an E population, and it's getting an input H. And this thing can include um, a feedback uh, process from uh, excitatory to excitatory uh, cells in there. That, that, cause that's essentially what this means. Yeah. It's coming from positions x, a distance away from x, x, positions x prime, a distance away from so this is collecting all these things. So this is an integral differential equation, not, uh, not a, uh, an ordinary differential equation. So this is a population equation. But I also realized that, um, so there had been a, an earlier formula formulation by an English um, man called uh, Burl, Raymond Burl, uh, whom I knew quite well. And uh, he had um, not included explicitly an equation for the inhibitory in uh, neurons. But 20% of all the neurons in the neocortex are inhibitory. And they control the behavior. If, they, if it weren't, it's like having a nuclear reactor with control rods. The control rods are like the inhibitory neurons. If they aren't uh, there, then the system is unstable and will blow up if it's a nuclear reactor here. It would go into an, um, an epileptic seizure. All the neurons would be firing, and eventually they'd fire so much that uh, it would be kaput. So I, you have to include another population, d by dt. And this one might have a different time scale from uh, the, the excitatory one. So here are the inhibitory neurons, and here's the equation for this. Um, 
let's say that's E now, and now we've got I here. Um, I, XT, plus 1 minus I, XT. That gives us the fraction of inhibitory neurons that are, uh, um, can be excited. And now this is E, and now there's another function for I. And now we have to add to here minus W um, E I. It's actually more complicated than this, but this is good enough. We have to add that term into the story in order to get the thing to work. Okay. And so on this side, there would be W, and this is E to E. And this is i to e. Okay, so now we have um, e to i, x minus x prime, e x prime t dx prime, minus w i to i, um, x minus x prime, i x prime t via x prime plus uh, a stimulus to the inhibitory neurons as well. So now we've got a, um, a pair of coupled integral differential equations um, um, for uh, what's going on. And so we can draw a little diagram like uh, for this coupled system. Here's the E population. Here's the I population. There's this connection is uh, excitatory from excitatory. This one is um, inhibitory from, well, this one inhibits excitors. And this one um, excites inhibitors. That, that's the way to write it. This connection is WII. And this connection is WEE. -E. So there's the connectivity of a homogeneous uh, block of tissue, which has both E and I cells. But now there's um, a space coordinate here. So this is the network at, at one position, x1. And then the, there's lots of them, and they're coupled together as well. So now I can describe an entire, uh, the entire structure of the neocortex like this. And these uh, equations, it turns out, are um, a bit of a revolution uh, in the field because they, they introduced something that um, wasn't possible in all the previous um, treatments. Uh, well, you can get some stuff only from an e-network, but uh, it's not really stable. What it introduced was that the idea of what are called um, attractors, dynamical attractors. That means there are systems uh, in which there's some stability associated with the behavior, attractors. And so the Wilson count equations were actually the first uh, equations in, uh, uh, in mathematical biology that actually showed uh, attractor dynamics. And by that, I mean the following. If I were to plot the phase plane of the locus of, of uh, points of local stability in the system, and this is I plotted against E, it turns out I can plot um, the position. This is the locus at which E is constant. So E dot equals 0. That's the locus of all points in which E is um, constant. And here is the locus of, of uh, all points for which I is constant, I dot equals 0. And so this point, this point, and this point are points of stability because it's an intersection of, of a point with I, equal, uh, I dot equals 0 with the point E dot equals 0. And it turns out if you calculate using uh, standard linear algebra, you can calculate that this is a stable attractor. In other words, if, you, if the system is in that state, it is stable to small fluctuations. Similarly, this is a stable attractor. This is also stable to small fluctuations. 
Now we know from uh, geometry or topology that if you have two stable states and they're separate, there must be an unstable state in between them because otherwise, how could you go from this stability region to a new stability region? You have to go through an unstable state. So this is an, an unstable region. And so if you're sitting here and you, and you get a stimulus that drives it up to this state, then you'll kick and, and you'll go into an upper stable state. So this was the first demonstration in any kind of mathematical biology setting of locally stable attractor dynamics with the thing. And it turned out at the time we discovered that there were two different kinds of phase portraits. This is a phase space of a locus of I and E activity. So it turns out there's another spa uh, phase pl pl plot, I, uh, E. And now it looks a little different. This null cline, these are called null clines. The E null cline is pretty much the same as uh, this one, but the I null cline has a different property. It does this. Okay, and that's very different. Now, it turns out, uh, if I have some initial state um, that starts here, say, it'll wind around and round until it finally hits on a stable cycle. And, th and so this thing is a li what's called a limit cycle. So now the behavior at this point is that there's a constant firing rate uh, from, the from the cells, both the E ones and the I ones in this state. But in this case, the attractor is periodic. So now the cells are, uh, uh, this, this is called a limit cycle. And the cells are now firing in bursts. So this would produce burst-like behavior. Whereas this one will produce constant firing all the time. So these are the two attractors that we discovered in 1972's. Uh, okay. We missed, actually, uh, that there is a third attractor in this system, which I uncovered um, a few, uh, just several years ago. It turns out there's an intermediate state uh, where you don't have a stable node. This state of constant firing is called a node. As, and this thing is called a limit cycle. It turns out there's an intermediate state uh, between the node and the, and the limit cycle where the system um, winds on um, it winds around as if it's going to a limit cycle, but it actually stops at a node. And this kind of uh, dynamics, this is called a focus, a stable focus. So this means the, the firing would start out like that, but then it would decline until it goes constant. The firing rate will become constant after a while. So there's this little burst of activity and it, de it decays and it becomes constant at a point. So the, there are these three kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, stable behaviors, a, a node, a focus, and then a limit cycle. And just by tuning the level of recurrent excitation or inhibition, you can pass uh, all the way from the node through the focus to a limit cycle. And it turns out that this captures the global dynamics of brain tissue uh, very, very well. So, so recently, there's been a great deal of work uh, done um, in the, um, on the spatial aspects of the story. I, all I've given you just now is the bulk properties, assuming uh, that um, there isn't any um, long-range connectivity. But this, in the next paper, what we did was we explored the behavior of a system like a sheet of cells. Well, and it could be um, basically a much more realistic model of a bit of the neocortex. So here's a, a, our neocortical slab. And now we can say things about the way 
activity propagates. And what we found was that if you're in the limit cycle mode in the homogeneous case, um, well, you can, and you set up the fact uh, that you have a difference in the length scale of excitatory to excitatory connections and excitatory inhibitory uh, compared with the, um, the inhibitory connections. If you make the excitatory connections long range and the inhibitory connections short range, which corresponds to the anatomical data, what you find is extremely interesting. You'll find uh, that um, you, can, you can get, if you give a very weak stimulus, you find you get a, a little bump response that then propagates, but as it propagates, it decays. People have, uh, over the last um, 15 years have been finding a lot of data that uh, indicates that this happens for weak stimuli. And recently, uh, working with uh, the graduate student that Wim and I both supervised, Jeremy Neumann, we've actually replicated this behavior within the framework of the wilson cowan equations. And it fits precisely all the data that's being collected. And I'll show, uh, if there's time, I'll show you one example of that. Now, interestingly, when Hugh Wilson and I um, looked at the, we didn't know about the stable focus. It turns out the dynamics underlying this is the focus. But if we, uh, um, if we increase the inhibition level, we'll start seeing a limit cycle. And if we have a limit cycle, we don't see that behavior at all. We see something else. We find, if I give a really strong stimulus rather than a weak stimulus, you get a big bump now instead of a small bump, but it doesn't propagate. It's entirely stable. You get a local limit cycle that goes up and down, so there's a local oscillation. It does not propagate. But if it's a weak stimulus, it doesn't drive it to the limit cycle. It drives it to the focus, and that one does propagate. On the other hand, if you disinhibit the cortex, so you, with an external uh, stimulus, you inhibit the inhibitors, then the thing propagates. It splits into two uh, waves, and this goes this direction, and that goes that direction. But if the stimulus is strong enough and you don't disinhibit the, 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 the tissue, it stays locally. Turns out these are very important effects uh, that can help explain uh, the effects of anesthetics on the cortex, and the effect of um, uh, strong stimuli versus weak stimuli on the cortex. And over the last 15 years, there's been a huge uh, num number of experimental papers on all this stuff without explanation. And this is the explanation for it. It basically, uh, and so what it looks like is that our equations actually capture extremely well the, uh, the mean field dynamics of large-scale cortical activity. I say mean field, what I mean is there's no attempt to build in uh, the effects of no intrinsic noise and correlations in here. Now, I've got about 12 minutes left to tell you about the next 40 years' work that I d developed, but I, there's no way I can do that. But what I can tell you is uh, I can just say a little bit about it. Um, so uh, nowadays, there's, there's a lot of data that res um, about these um, uh, that tramp uh, uh, traveling damped waves. And uh, as I say, our stuff um, um, really describes what's going on. But there's one, another phenomenon that turns up uh, with uh, a lot of these things. If you, um, this is mainly the work of Carandini and his group on, uh, who recorded from resting cortical activity. They, and they measured the correlation in the activity between two, two different points in the cortex, the pair correlation function, as it's called. Resting cortex, if you plot the, the correlation function, the pair correlation as a function of distance, d, turns out it falls off linearly with distance. The further away you get, the less is the correlation. But still, it's quite long-ranged. And th that's because the cortex in the rest state is sitting um, close to the critical point of a phase transition, where the change is from no activity to all, all active. 
that's a kind of phase transition. And I was able to basically, what I had to do to explain all that was to find a way to uh, mathematically um, map the whole mathematics of, of uh, this type, neural networks, into the mathematics of uh, quantum field theory so that I could use statistical mechanics to study what was going on. And once I did that, I was able to um, show that there really is a phase transition in brain activity where it goes from almost no activity to high activity. And there's a critical point at which that occurs, and it sort of corresponds to the, this point here. But it's uh, much more subtle. And so I was able to actually use the methodology that Norbert Wiener suggested to me 40 years earlier, because that's the methodology that's really the guts of quantum field theory calculations. Independently of Norbert Wiener, Richard Feynman introduced the path integral method into the solution of the Schrodinger equation. But there's a very interesting story there. Norbert Wiener was a professor at MIT. Uh, Dick Feynman was an undergraduate at MIT, but Feynman told me that he never ever uh, uh, went to lectures or read any papers because he was smart enough to work out everything from first principles himself. Uh, in his case, that was absolutely true. Um, and so what I ended up doing was to develop a way to use path integral methods to solve all these questions for stochastic neural networks. That meant I had to model everything as a little Markov process using the techniques of, of um, probability theory. And what was the process I used? It's a very tr simple thing. And which illustrates something I, I've always uh, tried to get my graduate students to think about. The best model is the simplest model. I mean, it shouldn't be too simple, but it should be simple enough that you can understand what's going on. And I use a quote from Einstein. He said, uh, a theory should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And that's exactly the point. And so that my little model is a, a basically a Markov process in which you have a neuron in a quiescent state and it goes into an active state. And so you can represent this state as zero, this state as one, and there's a transition probability of going from the quiescent to the active state, but for that I, I use the activation function, this sigmoid thing. And then there's a, a constant for the going uh, randomly back into the quiescent state. That's a, a, a little two-state Markov process. It could, couldn't be simpler. But this firing rate is the sigmoid function I introduced. And when you actually look at the probability theory of all this, you get basically um, something that you can solve by the methods that Wiener used in probability theory and Feynman used in quantum mechanics. Now, what Norbert Wiener did was to study random motion, uh, wh what is called Brownian motion in physics. And he developed the path integral method for doing that. Schrodinger studied the, um, sorry, Feynman uh, looked at the Schrodinger equation, and he developed a path integral method for solving the Schrodinger equation. But we know that if you take the structure of the Schrodinger equation, and you let time be an imaginary quantity, the Schrodinger equation be, uh, turns out to be the heat equation in disguise. But Einstein was the first to show that the um, Brownian motion, the equation describing the, uh, the behavior of Brownian motion is essentially the heat equation. So there's an underlying random process in, the, in, in Brownian motion there's, a, there's an almost identical random process underlying the Schrodinger equation. It's, the sa it's, the, it's Brownian motion, but in imaginary time. And, and, and you get, and, I mean, it's uh, an amazing thing that you can actually get that the, the two equations basically come from the same basic ideas about randomness. And so it's no accident that the Wiener path integral is the Feynman path integral in disguise, the ana what the mathematicians would call the analytic continuation of the Feynman integral uh, is, the, is the Wiener integral.
Turns out the Wiener integral is the one that you can easily compute with, whereas the Feynman integral is hard to work with because it's in the imaginary space. Anyway, it turns out that if you, if you understand all that, then you can actually understand the stochastic dynamics of large-scale brain activity. And the average behavior is given by the Wilson count equations. The stochastic behavior is given by what I call the stochastic Wilson count equations. And they tell you all about these pair correlation functions. When you stimulate, it turns out experimentally that the pair correlation function drops much more rapidly. So the, uh, an external stimulus destroys the internal correlations in resting brain activity, and you're left with things that are only correlated to the stimulus. And this captures essentially what everybody sees in brain dynamics. So this it turns out that uh, this has turned out to be a gold mine because it works like a charm. And 45 years after I formulated the equations, it provides a very precise model for what's going on in brain activity. And that's why it's caught on now, and people are starting to uh, use it all the time in modeling things like that. So when I go to conferences and I look at the posters of all the graduate students, um, something like 80% of all the posters are start with these equations. So that means I have to go around all the posters and, and uh, ask questions and pay close attention to everything. So I find it tiring to go to conferences. <laughs> but it's better than uh, the other, the alternative. <laughs> anyway, this, these are the Wilson Count equations. And uh, um, there's a lot of um, problems, of course, that. Uh, need to be done. It turns out that uh, Wim and I are very interested in epileptic seizures. And it turns out that Wim, um, for reasons about to fit, fitting to data, did something I thought was crazy. He introduced the following firing rate function. Here's the sigmoid, but then at very high levels, it turns down again, so you get something that's unimodal. And at first, I refused to be party to it because it seemed to violate the whole uh, setup that I had formulated. The reason is the following. Where does the sigmoid come from? The sigmoid firing rate function is the integral of a probability density function of the threshold distribution. So you assume that there's a distribution of thresholds in a, in a neural network. And so you look at the probability density of that, and then you look at the fraction of neurons that receive at least threshold excitation. So you get that. And that gives you the sigmoid. This is f of x. So what Wim was telling me was, well, you the probability distribution of thresholds uh, has got to look like that. But that doesn't make sense. So you can't have a negative probability uh, function. It can't be negative in parts. But it turns out there's two thresholds. One, the first threshold is for the, uh, uh, what I introduced with Hugh Wilson. But the second threshold is, has to do with a, a phenomenon known as depolarization block. If you fire a neuron at, uh, with a stimulus that grows larger and larger and larger, uh, as is well known from H the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron, or in our equations for limit cycle behavior, the bursting stops. And you get continuous firing in our model. In the Hodgkin-Huxley, it just stops firing altogether. That's depolarization block. So now you c if you assume that there's a fraction of the neurons that um, have, uh, 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 have depo suffered depolarization block, so if you start out with um, one distribution that does this and the other distribution d does this, what you really want is a function of the input that's equal to this one. Let's call that SAX times the fraction not uh, uh, subject to depolarization block. And that'll give you basically uh, this curve. And that's really the answer to the problem. So it's still built from sigmoids, and my theory is still uh, kosher. And on that note, uh, that I'm, I'm no longer calling
uh, women idiot, uh, I will finish the talk. <laughs> and this is filmed, so you'll see that. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of stuff to take in on for one lecture. I mean, it's 45, 50 years' work on my part, so it's, uh, I can't possibly go through it. In I did, though, in, in uh, one hour or so. so. Oh, I do. Oh, and then I can do more stuff. That's good. <laughs> so let me show you uh, a little bit more subtle stuff on the dynamics. So uh, first of all, let me just show you what, the, what Jeremy uh, Neumann simulated about this, um, this new behavior with the uh, decaying wave. Because it, <laughs> it, uh, it surprised even me that it worked so well. It actually brings me to some really neat stuff that we're busy doing at the moment. Let me get my chalk. I like to use my chalk. So here's the experiment done by Carandini and his group uh, over the last 10 years or so. You, uh, you give a weak stimulus, and you'll get a bump like that. And um, well, let's, let's scale it up just now. And if you look at the progression in time of this bump, it doesn't expand. It's not like a uh, diffusion process. It, it just uh, loses its amplitude. So there, in, at one place, is, is at one time, that's at different times, but one place, that's what it would look like. But actually, it's doing this. It's, it's propagating, but it's decaying. But it's not uh, expanding. So it's not a diffusion-like process. But what is interesting is the, this thing has an exponential decay. So if you actually make a plot of the decay, as Carandini and company did it, it's an exponential decay. And if you plot the velocity of propagation uh, as, uh, as a function of time, it's a straight line. This is all as functions of time. And it's roughly speaking a third of a meter per second. And this is an exponential with the space constant lambda so it's e to the minus x over lambda. And lambda is uh, roughly uh, about a third of uh, a millimeter, actually. Lambda is approximately a, a third of a millimeter. So it's rapidly decaying, thing like that. So if you do the simulations with uh, our equations, you get precisely this the, the, the same results. Now, that's actually uh, uh, remarkable that you get you actually get uh, such a, a close fit, and I, I still have to work out the theory, but I think I can do it. Um, but it's absolutely remarkable that we uh, we got such a, a close fit to the data, um, and I was uh, I was quite surprised at how good it was. And then I start to think about it. So you can ask, well, what's going on? Why is it? Um, working like this. It turns out that there has to be, you have to be in the neighborhood of something that um, was not apparent when I first wrote down these phase plane plots. Here's this phase plane plot for the EI system. Here's the excitatory null cline. But actually, if I'd drawn it a, a bit more carefully, uh, if you look at the 45 degree line, um, and I, I and I drew it uh, more carefully. It, in fact, it, you can set it up so that the null cline actually looks a bit like that, like that. It turns out, working with some other graduate students earlier, um, uh, Mark Benayoun and uh, Ed, Edward Wallace, we showed that. Um, <laughs> 
it's, it's a lot of uh, background here. Um, so 50 or 60 years ago, there was a neurophysiologist called, um, uh, I'm going to sit down a little bit, my legs are sore. Um, uh, Delisle Burns, a Canadian uh, uh, neurophysiologist. And he was a real pioneer. He um, was the first person to look at the rat cortex. And, and what he did was he undercut the cortex and he isolated a, a slab, kept the blood supply intact so it stayed alive. And then he started studying the properties of it. And what he found was he, if he gave the system a bit of a kick, uh, 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 an um, excitatory stimulus, it started um, um, becoming active, and it produced um, propagating traveling waves. But they weren't actually wave-like. They were more random. You got random bursts of activity behind a front which propagated at about a uh, third of a, uh, of a meter per second. He saw, basically, something really interesting. Um, Fifty years later, uh, Dietmar Plentz and John Beggs at NIH studied with a multiple microelectrode isolated cortical slabs. And they found a very interesting statistical signature. They found that if you looked at um, the, bur the, the burst, the activity, it was producing little um, random bursts every so often. And if you plotted the um, histogram of the number of bursts of a given size with the number of spikes um, on a log-log plot as, a, as a, in terms of uh, the, hi the, the number of spikes of a given burst against um, the number of bursts, number of bursts, number of spikes per burst, turned out it was a, a, a straight line. It was a power law with a slope of about minus 1.5. That's the signature of a random process called branching and annihilating random walks. And I thought about this a bit. And um, from the statistical mechanics that I developed, I realized that um, I could prove that that was the signature of something close to a phase transition called the directed percolation phase transition, or in other words, a, br a branching and annihilated random walk. So this actually uh, was completely consistent with everything we've done. But there's a, there's a special condition built into it. This line here, I've drawn through the null cline, the excited null cline, is at a 45 degree angle. What that means is that the, uh, uh, the fixed point that's here, there's a, an exact balance between excitation and inhibition. This is the balanced cortical state. And it's, what it's telling us is that the resting state, because this is the fixed point of the resting state, lies fairly close to um, um, a phase transition of this uh, character I've just talked about. It's not at criticality. It's subcritical, but only slightly subcritical. But that's where the resting state of brain activity lies. And then I, we developed a model with modifiable synapses that self-organize to such a resting state. Always self-organizes to this point, or actually to this point. And the fact that the two null clines, the excitatory, so we could draw the inhibitory null cline, and it's going to look a bit like that. It's going to be sitting, flying par uh, parallel to the excitatory null cline for a lot of its trajectory. And that is a signature that everything in the brain dynamics is being organized in the neighborhood of, of a special bifurcation that depends on two parameters, what we call a code two dimension bifurcation that's known as the bogdanov takens bifurcation in the theory of nonlinear dynamical systems. And it's the bogdanov takens bifurcation, the stochastic version of that, is the critical point of the directed percolation phase transition. So there's an entire uh, coming together of all the different strands uh, in, uh, at this point in this work. Um, in neuroscience, um, Murphy and Miller, Ken Miller and, and his postdoc Murphy, discovered that the balance condition was very, very interesting uh, and that uh, it, it 
seemed a good model for the equilibrium behavior of cortex. But there's a very interesting thing. The, the balance condition, you, you have this system with recurrent architecture as we've drawn it, all these kinds of um, uh, couplings in it. But if you have E and I, and you have these equations that describe the EI behavior, but you look at new variables E plus I and E minus I, as I goes to E, this equation drops out and this becomes 2E, or if we make this a half this, it just becomes E again. So you're left with basically just one equation, effectively. What that means is that you can describe the system as if it didn't have any loops. It's an effective feed-forward system. Now, the thing that has driven uh, systems neurophysiology since um, for over 50 years now is the feed-forward receptive field model of Hubel and Wiesel when they, and they study visual cortex behavior. But it makes no sense that that's the only thing going on, that, that it's a feed-forward system, because 90% of all the connections in the brain are recurrent. So it can't be just the, 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 a system with no dynamics if it's just pure feed-forward. There wouldn't be any oscillations, anything like that, except unless you built it all into the properties of single neurons, which some people do, but it doesn't make sense to me. Turns out, um, this balance condition solves all those kinds of problems. From a network with recurrent architecture, if there's a balance between excitation and inhibition, effectively it's a feed-forward system, if you're sitting close to the, uh, um, to the resting state. And that's precisely what uh, goes on in resting cortex. You stimulate it. It's anesthetized, usually, and it's, it's even quieter. Stimulate it, and you see the feed-forward characteristics of the system. You don't see um, the true dynamics of the system under those conditions. So I keep telling. And another, there's another very interesting property. When you're close to a phase transition, you can calculate what goes on um, fairly straightforwardly. And it turns out only the bulk parameters of the tissue um, are important. The, the, the single unit details that neurophysiologists love to measure are all irrelevant. So when I give talks to, to an audience where I know there are a lot of prominent neurophysiologists, I tell them that all their work is useless. And I'm very popular with neurophysiologists <laughs> as a result. <laughs> it's the difference between thinking about single neurons and small neural networks and neural population dynamics. There's a huge difference, in quali qualitative difference, between a neural network that's built from hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of neurons and one that's built from 5 to 10 to 20, even 100 neurons. The behavior is totally different, which is one reason why all these um, big brain projects about constructing circuits that uh, mimic every detail, in my opinion, they're a, a colossal waste of money. It's like having a, a map which is on the same scale as what you're trying to work on, like having a, a map of the planet on the same scale as the planet, instead of one that's on such a reduced scale that you can see the forests for the trees. So it makes no sense to me to do these massive simulations and, and fabrications of uh, neural circuits in the hope that you'll learn something from that that you couldn't learn from studying the original system itself. This won't, in my opinion, it's never going to work. And it's going to cost billions of dollars before the message sinks home if the, if the current initiatives proceed. And I think I'll finish now. I think that's a somber note to finish on. <laughs>